We're going to talk a little bit about miracles today, because uh, I think we need them, and we have them. Yeah. And, and we're still going to need them. So. Dang it. All right. What's the miracle principle? What's that? What's the miracle? One, one is that uh, we need to expect a miracle. You know, these things uh, uh, are always around us and the capability for us to have one is always here. And so we've got to kind of believe and prepare and be ready to receive them. Because like I say, we need them all the time. And if, if we don't have the idea that we could have a miracle happen in our life, um, chances are it ain't gonna happen. So how do we how do we get this done? One is we gotta keep our eyes open, you know, because great and wonderful things uh, can happen to us and they have happened to us. And it's hard, I guess, while you're going through some type of a struggle where you need God's hand in your life to be thinking of the best because what's, what's right in your face is the worst, you know? And, and as we focus on the worst and, and continue to allow that to pull us down, that becomes the thoughts that we have in our minds. And, you know, if God's going to be able to interject anything in our life, uh, we're not, I mean, physically and mentally, we're not in a position to, to deal with it. So the final miracle, there's several of them. This one says it's a highly improbable event, development or accomplishment that something or other um, brings welcome consequences. That makes sense, you know, I mean, you know, and then this one kind of gets a little closer to maybe what we've experienced in our lives. An extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural power, something that's supernatural that occurs. Now that's kind of getting closer to the realm of what we believe in. But this is more like, I think, what we talk about. When, when we talk about a miracle, it's God being in business in our life. And then, then we've got the evidence of the fact that, one, we know where that's coming from, and we know that you know he's not going to leave us alone in our time of need. So in Psalms, uh, it's written here, my soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. And I think that's important. You know, wait, our, wait, right? what's that? You gotta wait. Well, Sorry. we'll get into wait, but I think as much as wait, and you're right with that, it's my expectations when I come from him. So the expectation I have to find this house or get that job settled or fix well. this stupid knee, you know, or leg rather that I have, you know, well, all those things that we're going through, you yeah. know, we need to approach them with an expectation. And I think your testimony last week was that, you know, I'm, I'm done thinking about it myself. You know, the only thing I got left is expect that God can understand and see what's going on in my life. And then I've got to do the hard part there. Sometimes it happens like that. And sometimes it takes 127 days and counting and you're still waiting for that miracle to come, but we'll go into why maybe the weight aspect is there as well. But, you know, I don't think we should ever, forget that that God knows what our need is and we just need to keep our expectation with him um, I guess the reality of it is too sometimes what we expect as a miracle isn't what's God's plan you know maybe maybe God's plan in my situation is that this is it you know I've got to adapt my lifestyle now I mean you don't want to think about that that I gotta be the old man with the walker which, by the way, I tested at Sam's yesterday. And for the most part, it was pretty good. But my little <laughs> friend, he's sitting. He tells me, you sit here, and I'm going to go around and kind of do that. So I'd save my walking, and all these poor people look at this guy, poor sitting there like that. The only one and with the walk. Pretty pathetic sight. But I think <laughs> maybe I have to look at, that's it. You know, maybe my miracle is not my leg getting fixed with the fact that I get up every day, you know, <laughs> and somehow, some way he gets me through it. I, I don't know. I don't want to say that maybe your expectation is you're in that kind of that town home for a little bit longer because it's just not opening up at this time. You know, that's what it is. 
And at your place, you know, maybe those people will get some sense in their head and understand what they got to do to get the right people hired, you know? Yeah. But, you know, the miracle principle continues with expecting great things from God. And if you have that expectation, as Psalm says, you know what, you can receive great things from it. The potential there is you can receive. So how do we expect it? You know, it takes tremendous faith. We have to remove all doubt. Because doubt gets in the way of faith. You know, that's that stumbling block. So as we're expecting miracles in our life, and we all have those needs in our life, do a check. Do a self-check a little bit about your doubt. And you know, I'll tell you, I, I doubt it a lot. You know, uh, you know it, it's, 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 there's no way that God could have helped me to this point because of the doubt that I've had when this thing hurt so bad. And, you know, he's saying, you know what? I think, I think you got to kind of clear your head there, Walt, you know, because your doubt is impeding my progress to make something good happen in your life. So, you know, believers sweep, sweep away negative thoughts. Hard to do when you're going through tough times like that. But again, that's the, I, I think, the uh, requirement of our faith that we can, because, you know, we have to take hold of life, it says, with profound authority and confidence in God's possibility. If nothing else, you know, we all have some situation that we can go back in our life and say, you know what, God got me through that. And, and it wasn't a coincidence and it wasn't luck and it was nothing else. It was God in business in my life. You know, that, that I, I, I took hold of my life and I knew who he was. You know, what was the scripture say? Uh, I know in whom I believe that I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And if we get that mindset in our mind and our heart, who knows what can happen? So the question is, how deep is your faith? The ether here is something for us to think about. It says, for if there be no faith among the children of men, God can do no miracle among them. Wherefore, he showed not himself until after their faith. So there's that thing, you know. God understands where we're at. But if we don't show the faith that he can do it, you know, we still, still they may try a little bit longer than we might expect or want because we've got to come back to where's my faith. So it's kind of like a circle here. God knows and God can do, but God's looking at us to say, what kind of faith do you have to get it done so I can work my miracle? What was that thing when we were in high school called that if then? Yeah. Thing. I don't know what the name of it is, but if this, then that. Yeah. So if we have faith, then God. Will. Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. Now, there's a situation here about these people called Lucinda and Charles Sears. They're, they're down there living near the, the Everglades in Florida by Lake Okeechobee. And there's a hurricane that's coming. And, you know, you're getting out of there before hurricane season, fortunately, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're going to come in a tornado season. So well, God bless that. <laughs> I think I'd rather deal with a hurricane because you have like a week to get prepared. Yeah, you can find out. Here, we don't know, you know what happens. So, you know, I, I kind of, I like spring, but I kind of, I'm fearful of spring sometimes. But anyhow, uh, Lucinda and Charles are down there. Uh, hurricane's coming down through Miami up towards the center of Florida <laughs> by Lake Okeechobee. And, and they see the wind and the water and the peril on a nine foot wave of water sweeping their house. And it's not until they see the roof of their house blow away that Lucinda says, I think we got to go. So she grabs the daughter, her husband, Charles, grabs the two sons, and they see a tree off in the distance. And they think, well, this is reference. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how people think in hurricanes, but if the wind is blowing at 200 miles an hour, I don't know. If it's <laughs> but, you know, you don't think right when you see one of these things coming, you know. I, again, you so they go to this old man tree and they, they climb to the top of it, and as Charles is climbing up the tree, he drops his five-year-old son into the water. And so they panic with that, and, and he was able to pluck the kid out of the water, and, and they get high in the branches, and, and they just sat there waiting while the rain and wind was pelting them. And Charles says, you know, we're all going to die. It, it will be a miracle to get through this. And Lucinda, and she's the one with faith there, she says, okay, Charles, expect the miracle. Let's let God make a miracle happen. You know, I mean, that's a presence while you're up in a tree with 200 miles <laughs> around you and you're hanging on to your kids. And we'll find something else that goes on with this whole situation with Lucinda. But they're clinging in the branches and the storm is raging around them and, 
and she sees off in the distance three flashes of light, thunderbolts. <clears throat> her, who's a believer, she sees that as a sign that God knows where they're at and God's going to take care of them because he's in business, right? So <laughs> down and the rain ceases and the family clings to the tree all night long and dawn came and the water began to recede and the family uh, got to go to safety. And, you know, they suffered from shock from this thing. No kidding. You know, I, I don't know if I could have, my heart would have made it through that whole thing. <laughs> All said and done, the interesting thing is that eight days later, Lucinda gave birth to a healthy little girl. So she was pregnant when this Oh, jeez. You know, you know, but she had faith. I mean, no matter what her circumstances were up in that tree, you know, she said to her husband, you know, you need to expect a miracle. I mean, that's just one story, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is that believers' possibilities, it's not a coincidence or luck when these things happen. And it's what can happen when you fight doubt and expect a miracle, even if you're hanging in a tree in a 200 mile an hour wind. If you believe, God can make all things happen. If you don't believe, forget it. You know, I mean, that's, that's the story that it's going to write. And, but like I say, sometimes our miracle is not necessarily what God's plan is for us. And somewhere down the line, if we're in sync with him, we can understand that, you know, he changes us for the experiences that we have rather than the experiences change for us. So another factor that holds back miracles so much. We get on the wrong this beam. What do I mean by that? We get off the wrong beam. You know, we got off. We have to get off the wrong misbe. But what's the wrong misbe? No. Well, when you're feeling or doing bad or wrong, I mean, I should even have put in there thinking wrong, because I know in my situation, I I think wrong with my life. When it hurts so much at night, you know, some of the thoughts I have, um, there ain't no way that God's going to come and make a miracle happen or something like that. So, you know, I've been on the wrong misbe a lot. You know, and wrongness cannot produce rightness. You know, there's no way that God can work in an environment where it's wrong. And so, yeah, we need to get on the rightness beam, which is what? Faith, believing, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's having that hope that uh, all things are possible, you know. And uh, we, we see and read the scriptures, and that makes a lot of sense when we see and read it. But when you're going through an episode, all things that work together for good for those that love and serve the Lord just kind of kind of was out the window a little bit. We we tend to get on the wrongness beam with the reality of where we're at, you know, in relationship to what we know the scripture says and we should believe in. Well, what do we say sometimes? We go, well, we're human. Well, yeah, yeah, God knows that we're human, but you know, He's also trying to condition us to be something else than human. Although He's made us as humans. You know, he's trying to make us strive for the perception of Christ that, you know, that all things really can be possible if we trust him. So we need to become right within ourselves, And then we'll be able to find the possibility for miracles to happen. I think anytime we go through anything, it's a learning process. A yeah. growing process. Yeah. I, mean, God does, I mean, God doesn't make things happen like they're new to you. But when things happen, I think God says, Evan, you know, the movie Evan Almighty, I love that movie. And my, one of my, my second favorite line is when the wife is in the restaurant and she's, she leaves the husband with the boys because she thinks he's lost his mind. And um, God comes, you know, more than third time, uh, three men comes Amen. and talks with her. And, he's, and she was telling me, and he says to her, well, when you came for patience, patience, does God give you patience or the opportunity to learn patience? Yeah, there you go. And so that's kind of what I think of with all we go through, that it's an <laughs> opportunity for us to learn more faith. Yeah. more confidence, more trust, more hope, because, you know, if you don't have the trial, how you gonna, you don't learn those yeah. things. Yeah. And so when we go through that, hopefully your faith increases, your trust in God increases, your hope, in, you know, um, your Evan Almighty. Yeah, it's, a, it's an evolution in life. I mean, you know, life is a, a marathon and it's not a sprint, you know, and, and as you get older and as I think you experience more opportunities, you kind of mellow out with some of that stuff as you go. But then there's still that anxiety, like, come on, Lord, you know, how much longer, you know, in this situation? When God created you, though, he built in you the miracle principle. That means the possibility to expect from him 
that all things are possible. And, and my question is, have you discovered that principle and have you activated it in your life? Because our capacity for miracles is greater than we think it is really. But sometimes those miracles take a little more time than we expect. And going back to your yeah. point, James says here, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and if they not, and it should be given them. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. So again, the trying of our faith, as you said, works our patience. And we can't waver in that process while... It says, let patience have a perfect work. So it means that the trials we have, you know, they're there for some reason to work within us to be more perfect, I guess, you know. But being human, as you say, I have patience for that. I'll go on it. You know, come on, Lord, get with it. So the miracle principle again, you expect a miracle, but be patient and kind of build upon our faith. So we got to believe in God and Jesus Christ and realizing again that you are packed full of the capacity to receive a miracle. Going back to Psalms, wait thou upon God for my expectation is from him. You know, it's got to start with that. But God's recap here. What the song said. You do what's possible. You do the praise. I'll do the miracle. I'll make the way. You keep your trust in me, which was the Psalms thing about always expecting something from him. And you keep the faith with what's written in Ether about, you know, our faith gets tried, but we need to stay with it. And it says, when you can't go on, that's when I'll do the miracle. So I think that's the recap of that. Any thoughts? Well, we had a miracle this week. Well, actually, yeah. yesterday, <laughs> Jenny actually took a contract with the contingency on her home in Enid, and the problem with the contingency is they had a home to sell in Abilene, Texas, so, you know, they couldn't realistically buy another house unless they advised them of the contingency. And they don't take contingencies in St. Louis. They sell them. They take four and five contracts, offers like in a day for one house. It's crazy. So um, they actually ended up showing the house to another family. And they bought the house yesterday with no contingency. And they made an offer on Jenny's dream house. And the family had another offer, but they loved, I think they, Jenny sent a letter, you know, they say sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but she sent a letter of how much they were looking for a home to raise their children, et cetera, I'm sure. And so the long story short, they picked Jenny and Matt and they bought a house yesterday. So there's closing. I know it's so, it's a miracle. It really is. So they're both closing June 11th. It couldn't be more perfect timing. And I say, in God's plan, it's totally God's plan. And that's it. What happened to St. Joseph? Oh, he's still out there in the yard because they haven't gotten back to Enid. Are they supposed to dig him up? Yep, when he's done, when it's all done, yeah, you dig give him it up. to the next person who sells their house. <laughs> okay. I will let her know that actually St. Joseph came with an instruction. Pamphlet. <laughs> she sent me a picture of it. It's got directions on what to do. So I'm sure it is telling her that when you get back to town, uh, dig him up. <laughs> that is such a funny act to do. That's so funny. Well, I'm glad that's over for her. Oh, she is so, she is so happy and it's just taken a load off of her because she was so nervous of selling their house and not having a place to go. It was just really tough, but so it all. What's the city she lives near? It's called Smithton. It's S-M-I-T-H-T-O-N, Smithton. And it's a 
village, Kim. It's a little village and it's about a 25 minute drive to the base for Matt, but that's not terrible. And it's just, I'll send you the listing. You can pull it up and look at it. It's, it's a beautiful home. It's beautiful. Her other home was beautiful. This one's even bigger. This one's 3,500 square feet. <laughs> How wonderful. Acre, acre and a half. And it comes with a mowing lawn, a sit, a rider lawnmower. <laughs> oh my God. No, you need goats for that. Just let them graze. You need goats, Joan. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> well, they did say no chickens, so I'm sorry, chickens are out. So she can't have chickens. <laughs> oh, well, good for her. Amen. Thank, Thank you. in the country western. Let's try 58. All right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wish you all good morning. It's so nice to see you. And uh, I don't know, I, I was just so excited to be at church today. I was impatient to get here. <laughs> and I woke up uh, with a stirring in my heart. Um, and uh, it's good to see those of you uh, on Zoom. I hope that you're doing well and that you've had a blessed week. And we enjoyed some of the words that. Uh, we got to hear from our uh, apostles at their conference, and it's nice to see you all here uh, in Denver as well. It's good to see Tanner. 
it's always nice. I mean, every person adds, you know, to our group. And, um, you know, I, I thought of uh, an experience that I had relating to our Sunday school where I had a dream and I saw myself at sort of a, a, a church event, like a camp out. And I wasn't really paying attention. You know, sometimes we go up and down in our spiritual lives and it's so easy to lose focus. Yeah. And in this dream, I was sort of distracted. I was, you know, looking and thinking about my own plans for the day and my own life. And I wasn't really plugging into the meeting. And I saw this uh, person who was being touched by the spirit of God in my dream. And that should have been enough to re-engage me. But I was still kind of thinking about my plans for later on that day. I saw myself sort of, you know, scheduling that out. And this sister got up and began to testify. And it was, I would say, confirmation for what was happening as this person was being converted to the Lord. And she stood and she said, I know in whom I have believed. And when she said those words, which was part of Brother Walt's lesson, the spirit of God was so strong. And her conviction was something that finally shook me. And I awoke and I thought about where I, I was in my life and uh, what I was focusing upon. But anyway, uh, I wanted to give you a message today about the unseen. And uh, we'll see how, how the Lord inspires. And I just want him to guide whatever I would uh, share, whatever I would speak today. So keep a prayer in your heart. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot that's unseen. I would say there's more unseen than seen, really, in, in life. And that kind of goes along with our, our message this morning as well. Because a lot of our message in Sunday school is about faith. And what we need to do is have faith in the unseen hand of God and the unseen power that he has. And, you know, it's sort of a conundrum, I would say, because, I mean, for me anyway, I get confused about this often, that we're supposed to do our part. But my part just seems so trivial. <laughs> and God's strength is so much greater. And sometimes I just, because of that, I think, well, what does my part really matter? And then other times I think, um, well, I, I need to try harder and do more and, you know, do my part. And, and then I start tipping the other way and, and doing or putting more emphasis on my strength than I should. And getting frustrated because, you know, I think, well, I just need to try harder. And somehow my increased effort doesn't quicken the timeline of God's hand. And so I get frustrated. And I have to keep this perfect balance between what I can see and my part and what I can't see, and God's part. And put my faith in knowing that if I can get to this place of, of uh, being assured that I'm doing my part and I know that God has his plan. And whether in this life or the next, it will be joy for those who are rooted and trusting in God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a good aim it's, you know, to hit that mark on the target and, and a good place for us to be. But, uh, you know, uh, there's also in the unseen world, there's not just good, there's bad, right? There's unseen influences and spirits that are not good as well and so i've kind of got two parts i guess to the message today one that's a warning and one that is also i guess i'd say an opportunity 
And so I'll start with the warning. That way we can end on a high note. <laughs> um, you know, in the beginning of Genesis, it tells you about that serpent. And he says something about him. He says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. So we know that the enemy is subtle. He's unseen and he's kind of tricky. And he's trying to get in there. And I would say that today we see that. We see that there's an unseen or a quiet battle happening. The easiest way to win against your opponent, and I have to be honest with all of us today, myself included, we have an opponent. I wish that weren't the case, but we do. And so we have to be on guard. And if you don't believe that today, I mean, you can certainly at least believe that there's opposition and problems in the world that, in the world that you need to be wary of. And, you know, I, I think that it's not okay to pretend that it's not there. It's also not okay to fixate on it and fear it. Again, there's this medium point, right? <laughs> Uh, between extremes so, much, so many times that we have to focus upon. But, you know, it, it reminds me of that story of the Trojan horse. Uh, you know, because the easiest way for you if, you, if you're fighting against someone else, is for them to not even see you coming, to not realize that you're coming after them. And that's what the enemy wants us to, to be like. He wants us to be unaware of his subtle attacks. And, uh, you know, in the story uh, of, you know, the, the Greeks were fighting against uh, their enemy and they had constructed this huge wooden horse, right? And they hit men inside of it. And then those who weren't inside the horse got on their ships and sailed away. And it was all an act because when night fell, they began to turn around and sail back. And, you know, those who were their enemies, the Trojans, we'll they pulled their, this big horse into their own city because they sort of were taking it from uh, their enemy. They took it from the Greeks as a trophy. Mm -hmm. They said, look at them. They sailed away. They gave up. They realized we were going to conquer them. And as a token of our victory, we're going to take this strange horse they made, and it'll be a sign that we prevail. And, uh, you know, when night fell and the Greeks sailed back under the cover of night, the, they then entered the city. Well, how did that happen? Well, the hidden men inside the horse got out of the horse, opened the gates, and let the, the soldiers in. And, you know, this is sometimes the way that the enemy fights. And, uh, you know, there's an experience that was had to warn the church some years ago that there was a time when the wolf, which often represents the enemy, would come at us from the sides. And in this experience, we were warned that that he would start now to come directly at us. And so I still think that even though we see this happening, we don't really want to uh, deal with the fear and confront you know, what's, what's going on. And so even though maybe he's coming more directly at us, we're still trying to avoid uh, you know, the, the, the fear of that and the reality of that. And, you know, I, I guess I'm afraid a little bit of not that attack, but those who don't see it. Those who don't realize what's going on and those who don't see the toll that this battle is taking. And so, you know, I think a lot of people in the world are, are confused and maybe unaware of what's happening and what's being taken from them. And we who believe and have our eyes open and are spiritually awake are sort of like the watchmen 
for those who don't realize. And I'm thinking about how real this is. As I think about our families, our children, and those that maybe are unsure of their path and, and don't really see that bigger picture and have maybe um, their eyes closed to things or maybe they're lost a little bit. And it says in Matthew 11, 15, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And, you know, sometimes we hear what we want to hear, right? We don't like the reality, and so we sort of uh, concoct a different reality in our minds. It says, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, we have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. I thought about that. What does that mean? I guess what I think that means is that, uh, you know, he's saying here that the people were indifferent. You know, it's like, you know, I, I can do this for you. It doesn't work. I can do that for you. It doesn't work. What is it that I need to do to get your attention? And I think that there's a lot clamoring for our, our attention today. And the answer isn't to become numb to it or to close our eyes to it or to turn our heads and look the other way. It says that, uh, it says, for John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say he had the devil. So they found fault in John the Baptist because he wasn't eating or drinking. That guy's fasting too much. <laughs> but then he says, the son of man came eating and drinking. And then they say, behold, that man is gluttonous and a wine bever. So it kind of gives us this little insight into um, what, the, what those who were against God were doing. You know, they were picking on John for this reason, but then hypocritically picking on Christ for the same, you know, for the other, you know, side of it. And he says, um, you know, this man was gluttonous and a wine bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. And so, uh, you know, like I say, we see what we want to see. We look at uh, things and we kind of have our perspectives. And, but the question, I guess, is what does God want us to see? Um, I want to actually uh, get my scriptures here. I have um, my Bible, and I know I need to get it out. I forgot. I have a lot of my notes written down, but I didn't get all of them. And I wanted to read something more here than I had in my notes, and it's in Second Corinthians. So I'm going to spend a little time here in, in that area of scripture, in the Second Corinthians um, chapter 3. And it says there, in the first verse, I'm going to get to Second Corinthians, not First Corinthians. Here, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And so backing up for a moment, you know, to that question, what does God want us to see? He wants us to see with the eyes of faith. That we might believe in the word that he's given us and that we might believe in some of the warnings and the wisdom and the principles that he's given us. And look beyond the flesh and look at the spiritual things. 
And it takes faith to do that, doesn't it? And, uh, you know, I think that it's those who are looking with that eye to uh, the spiritual things that are able to help those who are maybe lost in this world. And so we've sort of become the messengers to help them, that they might recognize not only that there's a battle, that there's an enemy, that there are problems, but to recognize the solution. Because we're the messengers of hope today that we might know that there's a solution, that there's a victory had in the Lord, and that he's given us something that we could uh, overcome the world with. And, you know, there's this song of Zion. It's uh, number 77. It says, uh, and I love this because it sort of ties all of these scriptures together in one little message. And you get the, the lyric stuck in your head, and then it helps you to remember it. But it says uh, in the title, this song, it's called An Hour Before the Dawn. And what it says is that there are precious prisoners that Satan takes one hour before the dawn because he sees the night is weary and thin. He knows his time is short. He studies every weak defense and he watches every fort. And I, I have to tell you today that I think we're in this time. This is when the, the hour is late and the enemy is beginning to realize that his time is short. And so he's doing what he can. And that's why in that experience that was given as a warning to the church, that we were to understand that, that the wolf is coming directly at us and that we needed to be prepared, not afraid, but with our armor on about us, that we would be ready for this. And so if this is our time, and we recognize it, are we doing what we can uh, to address that situation? Not just for our sakes, but to actually reach out and be ready and equipped with understanding, with spiritual strength, with a great amount of faith and knowledge, being able to help those who don't understand, that they would open their eyes and see the way out of this situation that we're in. And so I think we have a great responsibility today and as the song goes on, he says, this is really provoking. All is not well. Be not deceived, for Satan rages on. I just, I, you know, so many times I think I want everything to be well. I want everything to just fall back into place. I want those who want to fight to just kind of lay down their swords and let it go. I don't want there to be conflict and war and, and all the other problems in the world but these problems are here and they they help us realize there's more to life than this flesh the whole point of what we're gathering here today and every sunday to think about and even to celebrate is to stir up the hope that we have a life after this life a spiritual life and that that soul that God gave us, which is already within us, will live on beyond this flesh. And that there's a kingdom that the Lord has prepared for us. And he's preparing his kingdom even that it would descend upon the earth as well. And so we're looking ahead to greater things. And those are the things that are unseen to the world. That the, the world and our loved ones, may God help us, would open their eyes to. That they would begin to understand the value and the treasure that goes beyond my daily routine, my house, my job. All those things can crumble to the earth, and they will. Just give it time. But something lasts forever and beyond that. It will not crumble, and that's what I'm holding on to, and that's what I somehow want to articulate and bring to life in the, the hearts and minds of my loved ones, that they might put their hope in something greater than the flesh in this life, which we know has an expiration, an end date, but my soul does not, it doesn't end, and so we have something greater here, and he says, his truths talking about the enemy here. They regroup and they make a plan attack an hour before the dawn. And he says he loves, this is sad, but he says, he loves to hear his captives cry. He laughs at their restraints. 
we have to open our eyes to what's going on. And then it says, a rescue mission forms tonight. An army of the saints. In the chorus, it says, it kind of emphasizes that point. He says, an army of the saints. An army of the saints. A rescue mission forms tonight. An army of the saints. That's us. We have to go out and be filled enough with the truth and the spirit of God to be able to reach out and touch and open the eyes of those around us with this message. And this time period of critical uh, you know, importance as, as things begin to kind of dissipate into good and bad. And, and the middle ground begins to disappear under our feet and we're forced now to choose sides. We have to firmly stand upon the right side and reach our arm out to those that we can to pull them over the line with the understanding that God has given us. And so, uh, it, it, to me, it's incredible, you know, what the Lord has done for us. And so, you know, this morning, the apostles, they were talking about the mystery of the gospel. And I think it is a mystery to the world because they don't look at those things that are unseen. They don't look with the eyes of faith. They only look at what they can see and touch and smell and taste. But there's more to life than what we can explain with the physical. And in the next chapter of Corinthians, it's, it's just so incredible, this chapter. He says in 4.1, therefore, seeing we have a ministry, we received, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And he says, but, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. That's what I was talking about earlier. There's good and bad that's unseen. And we need to kind of be aware of these things and discern them. So he says, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the, the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That to me is just mind blowing. If I walk through the, my life in that manner to say I'm on the hook now to behave before you in a way that strikes your conscience appropriately as I have accountability to God. I mean, that's a standard, right? To live by. And he says, but if our gospel be hid, I mean, listen to this, it be hid to those who are lost. And it's not that I would criticize them for being lost. I love them and want them to find what I have found, what I have discovered in the Lord. And, you know, we can do our part. You know, Brother Walt was saying this morning, Fight and, and do your part until that moment when you can do mo no more and then the Lord steps in. Well, when the Lord steps in, I begin to see my potential go from here to here. Like beyond, like there's no ceiling. There's no, like the sky is the limit. And suddenly things open up. And I think that's what happens when the Lord steps in. When you feel his touch, when you feel his presence, when he lifts you up. And I kind of thought that for a moment this morning. I, I felt that. I, I, I felt the Lord step in, and it began to stir my heart with excitement. And I, that's why I wanted to come to church so badly, that it, we might enjoy that together. And, you know, it just it reminds me that though I'm supposed to do my part and, and, and work for the Lord, what I can do isn't what ends up happening. It's what we can do together with the Lord. And it, it's amazing what he can do. And he says, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not. And that's what we see. You know, all of the things that, that 
the enemy uh, of this world ha has done. They blind the minds of people, and we stop thinking about God, and we stop seeing the things of God, and we even stop seeing the things that he's up to, that the enemy's up to. And he says, uh, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, and this is something that sobers me. I'm not up here trying to, you know, put on a show. I'm not concerned with how I sound. I'm not concerned so much with what you think of me, but that you would see the Lord in me. And he says, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Again, it sets up this standard that I'm supposed to be elaborating to you and expounding upon the word of God to you the messages that the Lord has for us today. And it's so rock solid. There is no contending with the Lord. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And what he has laid out is going to unfold in perfect order according to his prophecies. And we see this. Don't we see it unfolding? You know, there's a song that says, we see the prophecies unfolding very fast. That's the lyric. And I see it. It's happening faster and faster. And I'm kind of like right now feeling like that moment when I get onto a roller coaster and they strap me in and it starts to ease towards the edge. And I realize I, it's too late now. I can't get off, although I kind of would like to. And then we know any moment it's just going to plunge into what? All the things that the Lord has prophesied at the latter days. We're strapping in for the ride, brothers and sisters. Amen. And the Lord is going to see us through. And there will be that day when the coaster kind of coasts to a stop at the end of the ride. And we're going to rejoice saying, I made it. I made it through that crazy ride. And I'm so glad. And having done that, we'll be able to say, and I, you know, it's funny because we, we did this once. We went to Cedar Point. And rode this really big coaster there, and it was so scary. And I blacked out on the way down the first hill. And I thought, why did I do this to myself? I waited for two hours to ride on this ride just to punish myself with this experience, you know. And then when I coasted to a stop at the end, I thought, whoa, that was a rush. Let's do it again. That's how we'll feel when we survive all the things of tribulation that begin to purge the earth and prepare the land for the kingdom of Zion. We're going to realize it was worth it. It was worth going through all that for what the Lord has presented and prepared for us. And he says, so beautiful. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. And that's what we have to do in this dark world, is to remember that the light of Christ is shining within us, even when it's not shining around us. And that's how the Lord's going to spare us. And he says that this happens, that we might give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If the light isn't shining in the world, but it is shining in my heart, I'm the light then for the lost that I would impart and share with them what it is God's given me. And isn't that the whole point? That when you're called into the gospel, your eyes and heart and mind are open to a new realm. And now you have to reach out in love and say, hey, this is my testimony. This is what the Lord's done for me. And now let him do that for you. And he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. One of my favorite Christian bands is Jars of Clay. I pulled them up that this morning to listen to them. But that's what we are. We're jars of clay with all of our faults and weaknesses and yet containing the Spirit of God. Amen. Incredible. I mean, this is just what the Lord has done. It's just so incredible. And he says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I can't begin to, with my abilities, you know, describe to you the gospel, but it's by the power of God. Through him, 
that we can hear it somehow still. And he says, finally, we are trouble on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. I am perplexed I, 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 because the Lord hasn't shown me exactly as much as I wish. I don't know what's happening next month or the month after. And for, you know, someone who likes to plan six months out or more, it's kind of rough. But, but I, though I be perplexed, I'm not in despair. And it says, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And so I think we have to latch on to the, the latter end of each of those statements in this day and age in particular. And just remember that no matter what's going on, I'm not in despair. No matter what, how bad it gets, I'm not distressed. And no matter how many people would want to persecute or criticize me, I'm not destroyed. And I could even say that no matter what happens to this body of flesh, we're not destroyed. And so our hope is so mighty. And our, our reward for holding on with the Lord is so joyous. And so I've kind of come to the conclusion as the Lord has touched my heart today that I need to live more joyfully, that I need to be more happy and energetic, that I need to be more trusting in his power to add the increase, and that I need to lean a little bit more upon him, and that I need to make sure that there's no idolatry in my life, which means nothing in my life that would come before the Lord. That's my part today. As I think about what it is that I need to do in my strength and effort, in my diligence for the Lord, though it be small, it's that, that I take everything in my life and set it below the Lord in my list of priority. So God has to be first. He has to be what I live for. And I have to put everything else, my job and my things and my plans below that. And if I do that properly, my life will come together. That's when the Lord will step in. So we want the Lord to step in. We want to go through this life walking with him, not without him, and be able even by that to help those around us. And that's joyous and motivating to me, that I might be used as an instrument in God's hands to help people who are struggling to understand and make sense of what's going on today in this world. So may God use us in that manner as my hope and prayer. May God bless you today. Great message of uh, learning how to not be distracted in life, putting the Lord first and keep the focus on Him. Um, I always sing 27 in the country western poetry verses, and then we'll open it up for testimony. <laughs>